all night long. Vasta, the swiftest of Artaban's horses, had been waiting, saddled and bridled in her stall, pawing the ground impatiently and shaking her bit as if she shared her master's purpose, though she knew not its meaning. Before the birds had fully roused to their strong, high, joyful chant of morning song, before the white mist had begun to lift lazily from the plain, the other wise man, Artaban, was in the saddle, riding swiftly along the high road which skirted the base of Mount Orentes westward. Then, through the keen morning air, the swift hoofs beat their spirited music along the road, keeping time to the pulsing of two hearts with the same eager desire. To conquer space, to devour the distance, to attain the goal of the journey. Artaban must indeed ride wisely and well if he would keep the appointment meeting with the other magi. For the route was 150 miles, and 15 was the utmost he could travel in a day. But he knew Vazda's strength and pushed forward without anxiety, making the fixed distance every day though he must travel late into the night and in the morning begin long before sunrise. He passed along the brown slopes of Mount Orontes, furrowed by the rocky courses of its hundred torrents. He crossed the level plains of the Nicians, where the famous herds of horses feeding in their wild pastures tossed their heads at Vazda's approach and galloped away with a thunder of many hoofs, and flocks of wild birds rose suddenly from the swampy meadows, wheeling in great circles with a shining flutter of innumerable wings and shrill cries of surprise. He traversed the fertile fields of Coincabar, where the dust from the threshing floors filled the air with a golden mist, half hiding the huge temple of Astarte with its 400 pillars. At Bagistan, among the gardens watered by fountains from the rock, he looked up at the mountain thrusting its immense rugged brow over the road and saw the figure of King Darius trampling upon his fallen foes, and the proud list of his ward and conquest graven high upon the face of the eternal cliff. Over many a cold and desolate pass, crawling painfully across the windswept shoulders of the hills, down many a black mountain gorge. Where the river roared and raced before him like a savage guide. Across many a smiling vale and terraces of yellow limestone, full with vines and fruit trees. Through the dark oak groves of Karin and the darker gates of Zagros. Into the ancient city of Chala, where the people of Samaria had been kept in captivity long ago. and out again by the mighty portal, riven through the encircling hills, where he saw the image of the high priest of the Magi sculptured on the wall of rock. With hands uplifted, 
as if to bless the pilgrims. Past the entrance of the narrow defile, filled from end to end with orchards and peaches and figs, through which the river of Glindies foamed down to meet him. Across the swirling floods of the Tigris and the many channels of the Euphrates, flowing yellow through the cornlands. Artaban pressed onward until he arrived at nightfall of the tenth day beneath the shattered walls of populous Babylon. Vazda was almost spent, and Artaban would have gladly turned into the city to find rest and refreshment for himself and for his beloved horse. But he knew that it was three hours' journey yet to the Temple of the Seven Spheres, and he must reach the place by midnight if he would join his waiting comrades. So he did not halt, but rode steadily across the stubble fields. A grove of golden date palms made an island of gloom in the pale yellow sea of the fields. As he passed into the shadow, Vazda slackened her pace and began to pick her way more carefully. Near the farther end of the darkness, an excess of caution seemed to fall on the noble horse. She scented some danger or difficulty. It was not in her heart to fly from it, only to be prepared for it and to meet it wisely as a good horse should do. The grove was close and silent as the tomb. Not a leaf rustled, not a bird sang. Vazda felt her steps before her delicately, carrying her head low and sighing now and then with apprehension. At last, she gave a quick breath of anxiety and dismay and stood stock still, quivering in every muscle before a dark object in the shadow of a palm tree. Artaban dismounted. The dim starlight revealed the form of a woman lying across the road. Her humble dress and the outline of her haggard face showed that she was probably one of the poor Hebrew exiles who still dwelt in great numbers in the vicinity. Her pallid skin, dry and yellow as parchment, bore the mark of the deadly fever which ravaged the marshlands in autumn. The chill of death was in her hand, and as Artaban released it, the arm fell back inertly upon the woman's motionless breast. Artaban turned away with a thought of pity, consigning the body to that of strange burial which the Magi deemed most fitting, the funeral of the desert which the kikes and vultures rise on dark wings, and the beasts of prey slink fervently away, leaving only a heap of white bones in the sand. But as Artaban turned, a long, faint, ghostly sigh came from the woman's lips. The brown, bony fingers closed convulsively on the hem of Artaban's robe and held him fast. Artaban's heart leaped to his throat, not with fear, but with a silent resentment at the importunity of this blind delay. How could he stay here in the darkness to minister to a dying stranger? What claim has this unknown fragment of human life upon his compassion or his service? If he lingered here but for an hour, he could hardly reach Borsippa at the appointed time. His companions would think he had given up the journey. They would go without him. He would lose his quest. But if he went on now, the woman would surely die. If he stayed, 
he might save her life. Artaban's spirit throbbed and fluttered with the urgency of the crisis. Should he risk the great reward of his divine faith for the single deed of human love? Should he turn aside, if only for a moment, from following the star to give a cup of cold water to a poor, perishing Hebrew? God of truth and purity, direct me in the holy path, the only way of wisdom which only thou knowest. Artaban turned back to the sick woman. Loosening the grasp of her hand, he carried her to a little mound at the foot of a palm tree. Artaban unbound the thick folds of the turban and opened the garments above the woman's sunken breast. Artaban brought water from one of the small canals nearby and moistened the poor Hebrew's brow and mouth. Artaban mingled a draught of one of those simple but potent remedies which he always carried with him for the Magi were physicians as well as astrologers, and poured it slowly between the colorless lips. Hour after hour, Artaban labored as only a skillful healer can do, and at last, the Hebrew's strength returned. She sat up and looked about her. Who are you? And why have you sought me here? Why have you bothered to restore me to health and bring life back into my dying frame? I am Artaban, the Magi, from the city of Ekbatana, and I am traveling to Jerusalem in search of the one who is to be born King of the Jews, a great prince and deliverer of all mankind. I dare not delay any longer on my journey, for the caravan that has waited for me may depart without me. But see, here is all I have left of bread and wine, and here is a portion of healing herbs. When your strength is restored, you can find the dwellings of the Hebrews among the houses of Babylon. May the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob bless you and prosper the journey of the merciful and bring you in peace to your desired haven. But stay, I have nothing to give you in return, only this. I can tell you where the Messiah must be sought, for our prophets have said that he should be born not in Jerusalem, but in Bethlehem of Judah. May the Lord bring you in safety to that place because you have pity on the sick and dying. It was now long past midnight. Artaban rode in haste, and Vazda, restored by the brief rest, ran eagerly through the silent plain and swam the channel of the river. She put forth the remnants of her strength and fled over the ground like a gazelle. But the first beam of the sun sent her shadow before her, as she entered upon the final mile of the journey. And the eyes of Artaban, scanning the great mound of Nimrod and the temple of the seven spheres, could discern no trace of his friends. Artaban rode swiftly around the hill. He dismounted and climbed to the highest terrace, looking out towards the west. The vast desolation of the marshes stretched away to the horizon, and the border of the desert. Bitterns stood by the stagnant pools and the jackals skulked through the low brushes, but there was no sign of the caravan of wise men, near or far. At the edge of the terrace, Artaban saw a little cairn of broken bricks and under them a piece of parchment. He picked it up and read. We have waited past midnight. We can delay no longer. We go to find the king Follow us across the desert. How can I cross the desert with no food and a spent horse? I must return to Babylon, sell my sapphire, and buy a train of camels, as well as food and provisions for the journey. I may never catch up with my friends. Only God the Merciful knows whether I shall not lose the sight of the king because I delayed to show mercy to the Hebrew. So 
Artaban mounted the exhausted Vasta, and, tired and saddened, hastened toward Babylon. <laughs> 